What is happiness and what makes us happy? What is the ultimate end of human existence? These are questions that were explored in the ancient world and also in the medieval world, just as they're explored today. In the ancient world, in book one of his Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle uh, explores these very questions. What makes us happy? What is happiness? And what is the end of human existence? And in the Middle Ages, the great philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas, taking his lead very much from Aristotle, uh, but going beyond Aristotle in certain respects, explores the same questions. And to discuss those questions today and these works today, I'm joined by Tim Smart and Sandra Lynch. Uh, let's start by um, asking what is the difference between uh, the things that we think make us happy and what ultimately does make us happy. Do, how do Aristotle and Aquinas distinguish between those things? I think that for, Tim, did you? No, please. Yeah. Um, I think that for both, both of them, they're, they're taking a similar perspective. They're, they're telling us that things like wealth and fame and power are not the sorts of things that are going to lead you to happiness because happiness really is our ultimate end. So the question is, what is our ultimate end for both of them? And they, they interpret that differently, yeah. but that's the question for them. Well, I, I mean, on um, wealth, Aquinas, and I think he very much is taking up what Aristotle says, but developing it. Mm. He has that interesting moment where he talks about, well, why do we have money? We have money in order to buy something else, so bread or shelter or clothing. So money itself doesn't make us happy because we have it for some other purpose. And then the thing that we purchase, the things that we purchase with money, we purpose for a particular reason. Um, but our ultimate happiness doesn't necessarily lie in those things either. Once we have shelter and, and food and clothing. Except that they lead us, that they provide a condition for us that allows us yes. to reach that ultimate end. Yes. Yeah. So then money is removed, is a, a first remove um, from the thing which we purchase with it. And the thing which we purchase with money um, isn't our final end either, it relates to something else. So then how do we relate you know, the, these ends with something beyond them? Yeah, I think that's the question. I think that's, mm. but that's the question that both um, Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle devote uh, an enormous amount of writing to, uh, through the history of moral philosophy mm. people have wondered about, because it's a very powerful intuition to describe these chains of goods where you mm. want something and then even when you get it, there's some, like, there's some desire left over, you're not entirely satisfied or you realise you only want that good so that you know it can be a, a stepping stone along the way to get to something else and then so the, the the great question about like where does that all end up or like why are we pursuing these things is um yeah the big question and it's it's easy to, to motivate that question if you think about consumables like bread or mm. something where you're like I just need that to um keep this whole project going like to to keep living but if you think about it in terms of like a, a broader project like your life yeah. like what do I need in my life or where is my life going yeah. um, then I think you hit a really interesting deep question mm. yeah and those things that we've talked about um, relate to I mean because he talks about pleasure both of them talk about pleasure right um, so to the senses there can be physical pleasures uh, and those things meet those needs to us, not just needs, but also, you know, as with food, it can meet a need to nourish us, but it also is pleasurable. Um, why isn't, you know, for, say, for Aquinas, why isn't the physical a sufficient end in itself? He seems to suggest that, it, that, we, that it's somehow intellectual that yes. our ultimate happiness is in some sense related mm. to the intellect. Mm. And mm -hmm. he shares that with, with Aristotle mm. who says really our ultimate end is intellectual contemplation. But at the same time, and I, and I like this very mm. much about Aristotle, there's a practical recognition that the, the bodily 
um, needs yeah. need to be met yes. um, to allow you to be, in fact, part of being mm. a eudaimon, a, you know, a, a flourishing person, a happy person, yes. is to have certain physical needs and yes. a, you know, a, some degree of wealth and etc. Yes. Um, because that provides the bodily condition for you yeah. to be able to contemplate intellectually and, and Aquinas takes that on but says, you know, that's never going to be for a human being perfect mm. happiness. We're never going to reach that. Yeah. Because we can't have it. We can't have it. We can participate yes. in it partially. Yes. Is that mm. right? But mm. yes. in this life for Aquinas, we can never actually be ultimately happy. No, exactly. It's passing. If yes. we experience it, we also know that it is only transitory, mm. that it's mm. going to move on. Yes, because our happiness consists in our relationship with God yeah. and, and our participation in eternal life. So happiness in this life can only be imperfect. Perfect happiness is something that's possible in eternal life after death. Yes. So Aquinas says that. Does Aristotle, does he gesture towards that? Or is it more, is Aristotle really leaving open the question of what, you know, intellectual satisfaction is? Well, I think they definitely, I mean, so of course Aristotle didn't share um, Aquinas' theology, no. so wouldn't have had the same answers mm. about like the particulars of Christianity. Well, the beat, or, about the beatific vision, right. for example. But yeah. the thing that I think they, they both really share is that they say, once you notice that we need to give an answer to what the ultimate good mm. is. We're going to need to get into like a very substantial theory about human nature and a, a very substantial theory about what the um, philosophy of the human person is because you need to understand that. And then once you understand what needs the human persons have, what um, different like compartments or faculties there are of the human person, then you can come up with an answer for how you can satisfy those different mm. things. And so both of them take a very holistic approach where we have bodily needs, we have psychological needs like the need for a home or a family or friends or something. We have intellectual needs like the need to um, understand um, the way the world works or know the truth and we have spiritual needs and things like that. So both of them, and, and this is something which is, it tends to be like fragmented a lot more in modern mm. um, disciplines because you have psychologists who study the psychology, you have neuroscience scientists who study the, the brain and, and things like that. So. Both of them went in for a very holistic view about what is the human person, how does it all work together, and then uh, what's good for that whole complicated creature, which is like combined of all these different faculties. And I, th I think when we we come to read um, Aquinas and Aristotle, we, you know, sometimes we're we're pulled up. You know, Aquinas. Like Aristotle says things like politics is more prized than medicine, mm. and you look at it and you think, what is it? What? could he possibly be talking about? But he thinks that politics focuses on the good of the human soul, on the activity of the human soul. Yeah. And he, he thinks that the, the best kind of activity is activity in of the soul in accordance with virtue. Mm. So when you understand his definition of politics and the notion of the human being that underlies it, as Tim is, is suggesting, that the soul is in the mix here as well as the other aspects of the person's being, then you, you begin to see what he might mean in making a statement like that. Why do they both suggest that vir being virtuous is somehow related to being happy? Why, why can we not, for them, be happy if we deliberately do something wrong. I mean, we think, I, I think, am I right in saying that something that, if we do something that's wrong, it's nonetheless presented to us as a good, we think that we're going to be happy by doing it, mm. um, even if we're not, even if we discover later that it actually doesn't make us happy. So we act according to what we think will make us happy, but both of them seem to suggest that acting virtuously is a participation in real happiness objectively, yes. you know, so doing the right thing somehow is ultimately tied up in our happiness. In Aquinas it's easier to, to for me anyway, mm -hmm. because he connects it with, um, clearly with the next life, uh, you know, with the beatific vision. And so acting virtuously is connected to a reward, as it were, um, a final reward. Um, but in Aristotle, it's less clear to me why acting virtuous, what's, what do you get out of it? 
Why is it its own reward in that cliche? Virtue is its own reward. Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's heaps of answers yes, to that yes, question. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very, mm. very cool and um, complicated mm. question. And I think it's also one that throughout the tradition, lots of people have taken up that mm. um, question. Uh, I, I feel like Aristotle's answer is uh, he made this very um, close analogy between virtuous behaviour and skill. And so a virtue is sort of like a skill of being a human mm. person. And then so if you're trying to do anything well... Like build a house. Yeah, if you're trying to build a house or write a good piece of music or something, mm. you need to be skilled in how yeah. to do that. And if you're not, then the final product's not going to be so good. And then I think it's just kind of similar for a human being. If there's certain goods that you need to attain in order to be um, a good human being and you get happiness from um, when, you, when you achieve those goods, then the virtues are just those things which reliably get you those goods. So if you think about a really silly one, like you need to uh, drink water mm. for your... to quench your bodily appetite of thirst. If you're not very skilled at drinking water, you'll never get that good of being quenched. Like if, you're, if you pour the water over your head instead of in your mouth or something like that, you won't get the good. And then so um, ethical behavior can kind of be thought of as an analogy with that. It's just that kind of behavior, which is uh, uh, very good at bringing you into touch with those, um, those goods which you need. And I think they both, when they come at that, they both come at it thinking, okay, if, if you are, um, if, if you thought carefully about your ultimate end, then you're engaged in the development of, of your wisdom of, and, and this is an intellectual virtue. Mm. But in fact, that virtue doesn't mean uh, enough to them if it's not also um, put into practice. So for, mm. for Aristotle, you get, the distinction between the intellectual virtues and the moral virtues, this is, or you know, the intellect and the practical. And for um, Aquinas, he distinguishes between an abstract notion of happiness, which is much more that intellectual idea, and a, and a practical notion of ha happiness where there has to be motion or mm. action um, in your um, life to be able to satisfy that notion of happiness. It can't come just at at the abstract level. So I think that vir virtue is important both at the abstract and the practical level of the intellectual and the practical level. And But it's the intellect that's actually pushing us in that direction. It's, it's the intellect that's allowing us to um, understand what our souls are meant f for. Mm. So how does it work then where, on this question, and maybe you've just answered it, Sandy, that um, someone may not be an intellectual, they may not be a, a trained philosopher or even someone who ever sits down and consciously thinks through in a profound way moral questions, but they nonetheless are moral people. Um, so in other words, they're virtuous people, but they don't necessarily intellectualise their behaviour or even analyse the things that motivate their behaviour. Uh, in other words, in, in Aristotle it does it does seem to be tied up in the, the intellectual life and, or the, the philosophical life. Mm -hmm. So all of those things you mentioned about there are certain preconditions which allow philosophy to, the, you know, leisure and, and so on, which allow philosophy to take place. Um, but in, is, it, is that the case for Aquinas, mm -hmm. that one needs, as it were, that being happy, being virtuous is tied up with being a philosopher that's a really interesting question. And it, I mean, the whole, the, that whole question mm. of whether there's a distinctively philosophical um, answer to how we ought to live. Mm. I mean, that's a big question just yes. in, in its own, which is the question you're asking is, you know, why is, why is virtue or a disposition mm. to act in accordance with virtue um, necessary for us? But I, th I think for um, Aquinas, it's there as well, mm. because we need some evidence of... You know, there's a notion of not just intent, but actually carrying out and living with others and treating them as our neighbours, genuinely as our neighbours. What would you say to that, Tim? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting, like the question of like, um, like how intellectual do you need to be in order to live a good life? Mm. Because it seems like a ridiculous answer yeah. to say like only the very smart people well, exactly. can, live yeah. good li can live good lives. Mm. Um, because in one... Some, some moral philosophers reduce ethics to very, a very, very simple kind of 
scheme where what you need to do is help other people as much as you can and refrain from harming other people mm. as much as you can. And very often we fail to rise to those challenges and often we don't help when we can and often we harm when we shouldn't harm. And so a lot of ethics can be just like getting good at helping other people and getting good at not harming other people. And it seems like you don't need any particular amazing intellectual apparatus to pull that off. You need um, perhaps a lot of empathy or a lot of self-control or powers of the will or something like that. So to say that you need to have like certain, a certain intellectual repertoire to actually do moral action or lead a good life seems like a very strong, very strong claim. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not in book one of the ethics, but I, my memory is that later when he's talking about leisure, there is this idea, well, the slave doesn't have access to leisure. Right. The slave doesn't have the capacity, the, the opportunity, therefore, for the intellectual, philosophical life. And given that somehow, and I, I might be misreading him, but somehow for Aristotle, um, the philosophical life is tied up in happiness. Mm. Uh, and I'm wondering if, for Aquinas, it's somehow not that, mm. uh, on that plane anyway, that... Mm. Right. Uh, the, the person who has never read a book or not even capable of reading a book um, or never has an opportunity for an intellectual conversation um, may nonetheless still be virtuous. Yes. Uh, and in, in other words, there's, there's a, I'm, I'm trying to tease out if there isn't, notwithstanding all the similarities and the continuities, that if there isn't something in Aquinas and a, you know, that, that is different than in Aristotle on this on the, this point. Oh, I think so, yeah, mm. I, I think so because it, our, there's an exclusivity about mm. Aristotle's position which you drew attention to, you know, women and slaves and yeah. children, are, it's impossible really for them to be um, happy or flourishing in, yeah. in the way in which he prescribes. But for Aquinas, all of us have um, imprinted on our, our minds, on our souls, the eternal law. So we have, it, it's a natural inclination, mm. he says, for us to do exactly what Tim is suggesting, to do good and, and avoid evil. Mm. So everyone has that natural inclination within them. Uh, with that natural inclination, then the, that's going to push us in the direction of the possibility of living a good, a happy and, and happy life. So I think that, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you two think, but I think that, that that natural predisposition, and some people would argue against it, of course, mm. but he's arguing that we have that, that natural That we come into the world with that. With that, yes. Yeah. Mm. I, think, I think one very big difference too is, and Sandy sort of hinted at, at this, is that if you compare their systems, there's a very big player in Aquinas' system which isn't in... Aristotle's system, which is the person of the Christian God. Mm. And so, and then Aquinas talks about um, infused virtues as well as inquired virtues. So like the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, which are gifts or graces mm. to people. And they're not something that you acquire, but they're something that you receive. 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 Um, and so they're not so much there in mm. Aristotle. And it's sensible to think that when you are infused with those virtues, that they have a, a pretty big impact on how you live your life mm. and the the um, yeah the the moral behaviour of that particular person. So that and they're might available to everyone, which is right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so that might go some way to um, uh, explaining a difference between, say, if Aristotle's is a bit more intellectual than Aquinas's. Let's um let's finish now. I just mm. want to raise one more point, and that is, or ask one more question: What is this thing, the beatific vision that Aquinas talks about? Because, uh, you know, basically flowing on from what you've both just said, th there, the difference between them obviously is that, Ar uh, that Aquinas is Christian, Aristotle is yeah. not, mm. um, could not have been, <laughs> um, for historical reasons. Right. Um, Aquinas is, and he sees our ultimate happiness as lying in this thing called the beatific vision. What, what is that? Um, so I can give a very sort of like abstract uh, answer, and there's way more to say than this, but there's this little uh, suggestive remark right at the beginning of the section where he talks about that, where he says, um, when you have the, be the beatific vision, it's like there's nothing left to desire. Mm. Um, and it reminded me of there's this remark from the, um, the novelist, David Foster Wallace. He says, desiring things is always more fun than having them. Mm. And so the idea is, in this life, when you desire something, 
and then you get it, you always end up with like some residue of desire. You mm. never like totally fill up your desire tank. But uh, Aquinas is saying there's this state that you can achieve, achieve the beatific vision where you're totally satisfied. There's nothing left to desire, which he would say every other kind of derivative good or every other sort of experience of getting something in this life doesn't achieve that. You're always left still wanting something or wanting something more. So it's this, this state of where you um, no longer want anything, you're totally fulfilled. Thank you both. Mm -hmm.